a wonderful name it is. All right, Luke chapter 23. Turn me down, James. Luke 23. When you find Luke 23, if you're willing and able, uh, please stand with us. We'll just read one verse of Scripture. Luke chapter 23. If you're glad you're saved, say amen. Amen. We have been studying the story of the gospel. We have gone step by step, detail by detail, and uh, trying to catch all of the truth that is in the gospel. In Luke 23, Jesus has just died. He has given up the ghost in verse 46. In verse 47 is our text this morning. Luke 23 and verse 47. Now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God. Would you say those three words out loud with me? He glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. The centurion saw what was done. He glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. We started at the very beginning, and we started in the Garden of Gethsemane, which we call the Garden of Grief. And from there, Christ was led to the palace of the high priest, which we call the Palace of Perjury. From there to Herod's or uh, Pilate's Hall, which we call the Hall of Humiliation. And he was tried there and lied about. From there, we saw the road to redemption, where Jesus went down the road to Calvary, an actual physical road. And when we got there, we saw the title on the cross. After that, we saw the garment of God, that seamless garment that Christ wore. And then we saw the Savior's sayings. Jesus said seven things from the cross. We looked at those for four weeks. But today I want us to see procrastinated praise. Procrastinated praise. When the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying this was a righteous man. And I have a question for you this morning is what will it take for you to praise God? What will it take for you to praise God? Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you the Word of God. Thank you for giving it to us. Lord, I'm thankful that you have put truth, your mind, your thoughts, you've put it in print for us to have. Thank you for it. Lord, I pray as we study this this morning that you will uh, be magnified. I pray that we can worship you and give you glory as this Roman centurion did. I pray that our familiarity with the cross and with Christ will not stand in the way as a stumbling block to prevent us from being impressed by it. I pray that since we've heard the gospel thousands of times that it will not be boring. I pray that we will be impressed this morning by the sacrifice that the Son of God has paid to pay for our sins. I pray that it will move us. I pray it will stir us. I pray that it will cause us to open our mouth and give you worship and glory and honor and praise. I pray that nothing will be too distracting. There's already been distractions this morning. I pray that you uh, will help us to focus and to pay attention, help us to be still and help us to receive the word of God. And I pray that nothing will uh, take away from Jesus. Don't let anything in me take away from Jesus. And help us to give all of our hearts and all of our minds to you for the next few moments. May we give you worship in the name of Jesus. And the church said, Amen. Men's hearts often harden to the proportion of privilege that they enjoy. Men's hearts often harden in the proportion to the privilege that they enjoy. What I mean by that is when my daddy was a boy, his mama took him to Disney World in like 1969. And he rode a ride called It's a Small World. And it left a great impression on him. I mean, he was just a boy and it really impressed him. He thought it was amazing. So decades later, he wants to take his children to Disney World and he's so excited because he wants us to ride It's a Small World. The whole week leading up to going to Disney World, all daddy talked about was we got to go ride It's a Small World. And in my mind, I'm thinking, this is going to be the most awesome thing I have ever done in my life. This is going to change me. I mean, man, we were so excited. 
Well, we, my uncle works for Six Flags, and he's worked for Six Flags my whole life, Uncle Jimmy. And so we've grown up spending hours and hours at Six Flags. We would go on family night. And uh, family night is when only employees' families are there. And, uh, and so we basically would have the park to ourselves. We could get on the scorcher and just stay on it. And just when it would end, you'd just say, do it again. And it'd just do it again and, 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 and until you got sick of it. Uh, we rode the Ninja so much. I mean, we all have concussions. Uh, and the Ninja is the <laughs> roughest roller coaster in the world, but we loved it. And we grew up r- riding those rides at Six Flags all the time. So when we got to Disney World and we went to It's a Small World After All, how many of you have ever rode that ride? Raise your hand. So you know what I'm about to say. I was bored out of my mind. I was bored out of my mind. All it is is a boat and an inside river and puppets singing. It's a small world after all and 57 different languages. I was less than impressed. Now, the difference between Daddy riding it in 1969 and me and my sisters riding it in the year 2000 was the privilege that we had enjoyed. We were used to the scorcher. The free fall. Have you ever read the free fall? I mean, I miss that old thing. That pick you up and just drop you straight down. Man, I love that ride. That's what we were used to. So it's a small world didn't mean anything. We were we were the whole time we're looking, we're riding looking like this. Why why did you do this? Why did you bring us up? Why did you do this to us? This is terrible. And it, that thing lasts forever. It's like the longest lasting ride at Disney World. It takes forever. We didn't like it. Now, you may not be able to bear witness with that story, but you can bear witness with the sunrise. Every morning, the sun rises. Did you know the sun is 109 times bigger than this earth? All right, that's big. And so every morning, this massive ball of fire literally comes around, and it lights up everything on our side of the planet every day. Happens every day. I mean, you have have any idea how much light the sun puts out? I mean, with, with, yeah, everyone remember when the LED light bulbs first started coming out? Everyone remember that? And, and you would take them old yellow bulbs and take them out and put an LED bulb in, and you're like, man, this room is huge. I didn't know it was this big. <laughs> All that light coming in. And every single day, the sun, 109 times bigger than the planet you're living on, comes around and lights up an entire hemisphere every day. But the world doesn't get up and rush outside to see it. There, it doesn't make the news. Can you believe it? A star, 109 times bigger than the earth, come around and lit everything on this side of the planet. You don't see that. Why? Because we've enjoyed that privilege for 6,000 years, and, I mean, it's just the sun. It happens every day. There's no use to get excited about it. It's just the sun. And I believe that the cross affected this Roman centurion so differently than it affected the Pharisees And I think maybe familiarity had something to do with it. Now, we have in the gospel the foundational facts of the Christian faith. We have in what the Roman centurion has said. He says that he's righteous. He says he's the son of God in Matthew and in Mark. And he says the most basic of Christian facts, that Jesus was God and Jesus died for sinners. The most basic of facts. But our familiarity with them has caused us to lose our awe of it. Our familiarity with the name of Jesus Christ, what a beautiful name it is, what a wonderful name it is, what a powerful name it is. That song stirred half, half, barely half of you. Why? You've been, hearing that. You've been hearing Jesus for decades. And we have lost our wonder of it. Familiarity tends to rob us of the greatness. Familiarity tends to rob us of the greatness. You know what? You couldn't pay me to go to Six Flags now. You couldn't pay me to ride the scorcher. Why? I read it a thousand times. I am over the scorcher. I'm over it. You couldn't pay me to ride it. I'll take Mason and watch him ride little things, but I'm not riding. I'm not going. I'm familiar with it. No, I was 12. I'd stay there all day. I'd stay there all day. Now, familiarity has, has, has taken its greatness away. And, and since you brought up the sun, let me remind you that just a few verses before, the sun blacked out for three hours. I mean, the... Com- The whole earth went dark. You know what happened when Christ died? Nature bowed to Christ. You know that normally nature is really indifferent to our lives. It really doesn't care what's going on. I've been to funerals and it rained. I've been to funerals in the sunshine. I've been to I've been to graveside services uh, and it'd be beautiful weather. I've been to graveside services and it was terrible weather. 
You know, the nature really doesn't care what's going on in your life. The wind will howl and blow when you're trying to have a picnic and blow your paper plates all over the place. It doesn't care that you're trying to have a party. It does not care what kind of day you're having. You can wake up in a bad mood and the sun will either be shining or it'll be cold and raining like it was this morning. It does not care what happens in human life. But when Christ died, nature cared. And when Christ died, nature bowed and it got its attention. And that Roman centurion saw that and he witnessed that and it done something to him. The, the cross affected him in a way that it affected no one else there that day. It caused him to glorify God. And he alone stands as the one man at Calvary to worship. While the others mock, while the others walk away in disappointment, while the others make fun of him and doubt, this soldier, this Roman centurion, praised him. Procrastinated praise. I want to know what it'll take for you to praise God. I want us to see this centurion for a little bit this morning. First, I want you to see the centurion's position. The centurion's position. First, it was a career position. It was a calloused position. And it was a contrary position. It was a career position. It was a calloused position. It was a contrary position. Now, many people were there at the cross that day. Many people were there. Now, some were there because they wanted to be. John and Mary were there. They were there out of commitment to Jesus Christ. They did not want this to happen. They were gravely disappointed in this. They were heartbroken. A soul had pierced through Mary's soul. This was not a good thing, but they were there for Jesus. They didn't want this to happen. They wanted Him to be king, not dead. But they're there for Him. No matter what happens, they're going to stick with Jesus. They're there out of commitment. The thieves were there. Oh, they were there out of condemnation. Now, it's a moot point to say they didn't want to be there. But they did not want to be there. And they certainly were not there for Jesus. But nonetheless, they were there. This Roman centurion and all his, they were there. But they were not there out of commitment. They were not there out of condemnation. They were there because it was their career. They were there because it was their job. It was their job to be there. And this centurion was there because he was at work. He was at work. Well, he got out of bed that morning. He did not get out of bed, Brother Bo, to go find the Son of God. He got out of bed to go to work. Now, now, he didn't start the day that way, but he certainly ended it that way. And isn't it interesting that God can use the most ordinary and basic parts of our lives to bring us to himself? This guy just got up and went to work, and he wound up being next to the crucified Son of God and wound up knowing who God's Son was. How about that? That's a great day. That's a really great thing. And God used just going to work. God can use the most basic and ordinary parts of our lives to bring us closer to Himself. This was a career position. It was a calloused position. It's a calloused position. You know what His job was? You think, killing people. Well, it was more than just killing people. His job was to kill people without caring. This had to be a man whose senses were dulled. This had to be a man who would not feel sympathy or mercy, or compassion. This had to be a man that could take it. He had to be able to stomach it. He had to be able to watch men literally suffocate. He had to watch men bleed to death. He had to nail people to something. That's gruesome. That takes a calloused individual. And his job was to be there and not feel. Your job is to be there and not to care about the pain and the suffering and the anguish and the suffering of these people. Do not, do not, do not, do not back up. Do not change your mind. You are here by order of Rome to crucify these people, to beat them half to death, and then nail them to a cross. And your job is to do that without caring. He was calloused. And isn't that what the world wants us to do? The world wants us to lose our feeling. The world wants us to lose our feelings, especially when it comes to the Son of God. Especially when it comes to the Son of God. This was a calloused position, but it was a contrary position contrary position. He did not get out of bed that morning on, the, on Jesus' side. He got out of bed that morning on Rome's side. He's a centurion of Rome. He is a centurion of Rome. He does what Rome says. He was not on Jesus' side. He was contrary to him. Mark chapter 15, Brother James, you can put that on the screen for us. Mark 15, 
You missed it somewhere, brother. Go back. I don't know what happened to it. Mark 15, I'll just, I'll just read it to you. How about that? When the centurion which stood over against him saw what was done, he said, truly, this was the Son of God. He stood over against him. So we know where he was standing. He was standing close to Jesus, but it doesn't just tell us where he was standing. It was telling us how he was standing. Against means contrary. And so this Roman centurion was there at the cross, not just there to watch. He was there in charge. He was the authority on top of that hill. He was there to make sure that what's supposed to happen happens. He was against Jesus. He's there to make sure that this man doesn't get off this cross. He doesn't come down. He dies right there. He's going to stay there until it's over. He is not on his side. By the way, we all start the day that way. We all start the day... Our, our, our bodies are not wanting to praise God. Our bodies are not wanting to give God glory. Our bodies want to give itself glory. Our body wants to do what it wants to do, not what God wants it to do. And this centurion did not wake up to praise God. Now, he did end the day that way. He does start to glorify God by the end of this thing, but he doesn't start that way. He starts contrary. And all of us start the day that way. Praise and worship is not a natural thing of the flesh. Praise and worship is not a natural thing of the flesh. Lifting your hands to God is is not a natural thing for the flesh to do. Saying amen or hallelujah or bless your holy name or anything, any of those things. Giving God worship and glory and honor is not a natural thing of the flesh. We don't start that way. Our flesh is contrary to God. Paul said that there's, there's members in my, there's, there's war in my members are contrary to the one to the other. My flesh wants to go this way. My spirit wants to go that way. And these two things are contrary to the one to another. And at the cross of Jesus Christ, you've got a Roman centurion and you've got the Son of God. And those two things were contrary to the one to the other. It was contrary. He was not on his side. But he doesn't end that way. Something changed in him. Something called him to pray. Something motivated him and changed his mind. And so we see not just the centurion's position, but we see the centurion's perspective. His perspective. He saw something, he experienced something or witnessed something that caused him to change his mind. Luke 23 and verse 47 is very clear. When he saw what was done, he glorified God, saying certainly this was a righteous man. When he saw what was done. So it's pretty clear we can say that what changed his mind was what he saw. Are we okay this morning? And so what he saw is what changed his mind, his perspective. When he saw what was done. When he he saw three things that were done. He saw what was done by the crowd. He saw what was done by the courts. And he saw what was done by Christ. He saw what was done by the crowd, what was done by the courts, and what was done by Christ. The first thing he saw was what was done by the crowd. When, when, they, when they brought Jesus out of the, the palace of the high priest and that, and that mob, the Roman centurion was there. When they brought him to Pilate's house, that Roman was there. When they screamed, crucify this man, he was there. When they said, we have no king but Caesar, he was there. And he watched his own people betray him. He watched his own people say, we don't want him, we want him dead. He watched his people do that. He watched the crowd do that. When, when, when Pilate tried to talk them into taking Barabbas instead, they said, no, 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 we don't want Barabbas. We want you to kill Jesus instead. That Roman centurion saw that. He saw the crowd do that to Jesus. And doubtlessly that made an impression on his mind. If his own people hate him so much and they don't want him, they want him dead this bad, he must be an awful person. He saw what was done by the crowd, but then he saw what was done by the courts. He saw what was done by the courts. He saw as as Pilate uh, tried to get away out of it, but but then he didn't. And then he washed his hands of it. In Matthew chapter number 8, we learn from another centurion. He said, I'm a man under authority, having soldiers under me. I say to this man, go, and he goeth. And to another, come, and he cometh. And to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. And so, and so centurions understood authority. And when a centurion said, do this, someone did it. And when he said to a servant, go, the servant went. 
And he was a servant of Rome. He was the centurion. He was a servant of Pilate. And when his boss said go, he would go. When his boss said do, he would do. He understood authority. And so he understood that if Pilate wanted to, Pilate could have any time said, you know what, we're not doing this, we're not killing this man. I have found no fault in him. There is no legal grounds to kill him. You Jews are going to have to just get over it and drop it, and I'm letting him go. Pilate could have done that. He would not have been the first person that, uh, first time that Rome uh, just took over the Jews and, and forced them to do something or prevented them from doing something. It wouldn't be the first time. And so as this Roman centurion sees Pilate and Herod and the court system just say, you know what, just kill him anyway, that left an impression on his mind. Man, if his people don't want him, and if my boss don't even want him, this must be a bad guy. This must be a bad guy. And all points are leading this centurion away from praising Jesus. He saw what was done by the crowd. He saw what was done by the courts. But then he saw what was done by Christ. And this is what changed him. This, is, this was the turning point for this centurion. Now, I don't know if the centurion actually drove the nails, but I know he watched it. I don't know if he actually swung the hammer, but I, I, I'm sure he probably had before. And I know he was standing there watching the guy who did swing the hammer. And I don't know if he, I, I don't know what all he done physically, but I know he was a part, and I know he saw it. And I know he watched Jesus never resist. He watched Jesus lay his life down of himself while the other men probably jerked away and, and tried to run or tried to get loose, Jesus never did. And he watched all of that. He watched Jesus pray to his Father to forgive them, including himself. Including himself. He watched Jesus Christ on the cross say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He watched Jesus Christ look at a thief who was condemned to die and say, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. He watched Jesus look down at his mother and to a friend that this Roman probably did not know and try to take care of them. He watched as the sun went darkened and as the sun got black and he heard him say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He watched him say, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. He watched all of these things and when he saw that... That was a turning point for him. He heard the prayers that Christ made to God, and that changed him. He may have felt nothing when the crowd screamed. He may have felt nothing at all as, as, as Pilate ordered them to kill them. I mean, he is a man of war. He is no stranger to angry people. He is no stranger to angry mobs and loud screams. He may have felt nothing as they beat the back of Christ to a, to a, to a pulp, an innocent man. He's a soldier of Rome. Killing innocent people is just everyday actions for them. He may have felt nothing, but when Jesus began to speak, and when Jesus began to pray, and when he saw the behavior of Christ, when he saw what Christ done, that began to change him. The calloused and hardened man who was numb began to feel something. Fire melts ice. The sun unfolds the flowers. And the cross can melt the hardest heart and draw from it the greatest worship, and greatest praise. The centurion's position, the centurion's perspective, but would you see thirdly the centurion's praise? The centurion's praise. He glorified God. To glorify literally means to worship. It means to praise. He glorified God saying certainly this was a righteous man. His praise was certain. His praise was central. His praise was corporate. His praise was certain, his praise was central, his praise was corporate. Now, this hardened, burly, calloused, numb man begins to feel and begins to praise God. And from his lips it comes. And glory is finally given to God in this slaughter. This offering of the just for the unjust finally has produced some praise. Someone finally says one thing right. No one has said anything right this today except for him. It was certain. Notice the very first thing he says in Luke 43, or 40, uh, 23 and verse 47. The first thing he says is, certainly, certainly this was a righteous man. Mark and Matthew say truly. Whether it's truly, whether it's certainly, regardless, he was certain of what he was saying. He was, he was resolved. He was convinced that this man was a righteous man, that this man was the Son of God, 
this was not just a normal person. He has probably seen thousands of men die. He had probably seen hundreds of men crucified. But this man was different. This man w- w- was God in the flesh. This man is not like the other men. In Mark chapter 15 and verse 39, when the centurion which stood over against him saw that he cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, truly, truly, this man, this man, that body that's hanging on that cross, that That man, that's the Son of God. He was certain of that. He was resolved that that was true. As sure as Peter was, the centurion was. And he glorified Christ as God in the flesh. When Peter said, uh, Jesus asked him, Who do men say that I am? And Peter responded, Blessed, uh, he said, That thou art uh, the Son of God, thou art the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And so when, when Peter said, Thou art the Son of God, and I'm sure about it, Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon. He blessed him, and he said, God has told you that. So when the Roman centurion is standing next to the cross, and he says, That's the Son of God, I wonder who told him that. Must have been the same person that told Peter that. Must have been the same person that told Peter that. God. He was certain that Christ was worthy of glory. Well, maybe, maybe you've procrastinated your praise because you're just not convinced enough yet. Maybe you've procrastinated praise because you're not sure yet. You know, I've heard a hundred times in the last two years, Preacher, I about shouted. I was this close. Boy, I was this close. Boy, I, I, was, I was this close to standing up and, and saying, I was this close to, to shouting. I was this close to saying, what's it going to take to get you over the edge? What's it going to take to push you over the line? Don't about shout. Just go ahead and shout. Don't about say amen. Just go ahead and say amen. Don't about say hallelujah. Just go ahead and say hallelujah. Don't about clap your hands. Just go ahead and clap your hands. What, what, put, what keeps you from going over the line? Maybe it's you're just not convinced enough. We come close to praise. We come near it. But the flesh draws back. We come near it during the singing. What a beautiful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. I love that part, that bridge, that you have no rival. Man, that's true. There's no rival. There's no, uh, there's no other option. There's no second in command. No. I love that part. When we come to phrases like that and verses like these, our flesh, our, our spirit gets close, but our flesh begins to draw back. No, his praise was certain. I want you to notice his praise was central. His praise was central. He said, certainly this was a righteous man. And Matthew and Mark, he said, truly this man was the Son of God. The Son of God. He makes the declaration, he's the Son of God. Now, not everybody knew that. Not everyone understood that Christ was God's son. That's why they're kind of trying to have him killed over this thing because they think he's being blasphemous. Now, when he said that, he probably did not mean everything that, that Paul would later mean. When Paul wrote the doctrines of Christology, he wrote the, the lines in Ephesians about Christ, this, this Roman centurion probably didn't mean everything that Paul meant. He probably didn't have all that figured out. Later on, Paul would write in 2 Timothy, he would say, "...great is the mystery of godliness." God was manifest in the flesh. Now, that's probably not maybe all what the Roman meant. He probably didn't understand the virgin birth. He probably didn't understand that Jesus was the Alpha and Omega, that he had an eternal past. He probably didn't understand all of that. He probably didn't understand that Christ would later come back and, and set up a kingdom. He didn't know that Christ was going to get up back, get, come back from the dead in just three days. He probably didn't understand that. He didn't understand that, that, that Jesus would, would return on a white horse and, and is going to reign eternally as the King of kings and Lord of lords. He probably didn't understand all of that. But one thing he did know, that that man was dying and that man was God. It was a central thing. He just, he didn't know it all. He didn't have all this this wealth of doctrine in his heart and mind. He didn't, it wasn't all this grand revelation. It was just this one central truth. That man is God and that man's dying for me. That's all he knew. That's all he knew, and that was enough for him to glorify God over. And all he knew was that man is God, and that man's dying for me. He's dying for the thief on the one side that liked him. He's even dying for the thief on the other side that didn't like him. He's dying for all these people that hate his guts. He's dying for my boss, Pilate. He's dying for the high priest. He died for Herod as despicable, 
filthy and nasty as Herod is, he's dying for him. That man is God and he's dying for me. That's all he knew. And can I say that that's all you need to know to worship God? But listen, we have a great deal more than that, don't we? Look, you and I know that in three days Jesus came back from the dead. Came back from the dead. He died and he came back from the dead. Rome never saw that before. They certainly didn't even see that coming. They were so shocked that that actually truly happened. He didn't know that was going to happen, yet he praised God anyway. You know that happened. You know that Christ died, but then he came back from the dead. You know that. You know that a month later, there in the Acts chapter number 1, that he ascended back up into heaven, sat down on the right hand of God, where he ever liveth to make intercession for you and me. You know more than the Roman. You know more than that centurion. You know more than that he was just God and that he died. You know that he came back from the dead. You know that he ascended back up into heaven, where he ever liveth to make intercession for you and me. You know that he's planning on coming back. You know John 14. If I go, I go to prepare a place for you, and I will die. I will come again and receive you unto myself. You know all of that, yet can't glorify God. What, what holds you back from praising God? He had one central piece of truth. One central piece of truth. He didn't know the Romans road. He didn't know the Easter story. He didn't know the virgin birth story. He didn't know any of that, yet he praised God. Maybe, maybe you've procrastinated praise because... You just don't have everything figured out yet. You know, maybe, maybe you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And that doubt and that fear is holding you back. That's, that, 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 uh, that's what's standing in front of you is the fear of the unknown. I just, I just don't know what's going to happen tomorrow about this. I'm afraid of how this is going to turn out. I'm afraid of what's going to be in my mailbox tomorrow. I'm afraid of that voicemail that I will not check. I'm afraid of that email that I'm not opening because I don't know want to know what it says. And I'm worried about what's going to happen. I'm afraid to even bring this up to my spouse because I know that it may end in the biggest fight we've ever had and we may not even make it through this fight. So I, I, I've got so much on my mind that I don't know right now and I, I've got so much that's unknown and so much I'm uncertain about and I, and, and I just can't worship God right now because I'm worried about all these things. It doesn't matter what you don't know. What does matter is what you do know. And what you do know is that Jesus Christ was God. Jesus Christ died for you. Jesus Christ came back from the dead. Jesus Christ is send it up into heaven and he makes every intention on coming back to get us out of this place so we can live forever in heaven and that is enough to praise God about Amen. that is enough to praise God about Amen. how firm a foundation is laid for our faith in his excellent word what more can he say than to you he hath said he's given it all to us he's given us his word he has given us a book that tells us everything we need to know Every reason to worship is found in this book. Central worship, certain worship, but it was also corporate worship. Now, he seems to be alone, but Matthew was clear that he was not alone. And Matthew 27 says, When the centurion and they that were with him, watching Jesus, saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. And they that were with him. He was not the only Roman soldier on the clock that day. There were other men with him. And they were all standing around. And they all agreed. Maybe if they didn't all agree, maybe, maybe some thought, nah, I, think the, I think the boss is crazy. I think, the, I think the centurion's slipping. Nonetheless, he praised right in front of them. He praised God right in front of his heavily bearded, heavily armed, mean, soulless soldier comrades. He glorified the Son of God. And I believe because of what Matthew says, that they glorified with him. He could have waited till he got home to praise in private, but he didn't. He praised in public. Their boss, the centurion, everyone look now. The boss, the centurion, he said, truly, that's the son of God. You know what that means? That means he just killed him. He just admitted to killing God's son. What self-incrimination? That's the son of God, and he's dead, and I did it. You done it under my command. 
we just killed God's son. God's son is dead, and it's because of me. What self-incrimination? Maybe you've procrastinated praise because you don't see how guilty you are yet. Maybe, maybe you haven't praised God because you're in church and, and it's just always been that way and you're doing God a favor by being here. So when they say, let's praise Jesus, just, I, am, I mean, I'm, I'm here for God and that's, that's enough. But you don't see that it's your fault that the Son of God had to die. It's because of sin that the Son of God had to die. Y'all don't get squirmish now. I don't get squirmish. We're almost done. Miss Leslie, why don't you go ahead and come to the piano? Will that make y'all feel better? <laughs> what self-incrimination? He says, that was the Son of God we just killed. I mean, he could turn over to a man maybe named Bruno. Let's just go Bruno. Bruno, we just killed God's Son. Maximus, we just killed the Son of God. We just executed the Son of God, the Creator, the, 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 one, in, the, the one upstairs, so to speak. How a, I don't, we wouldn't say that, but maybe a Roman pagan would. The one on the top, the one on the top of the God pole, that one. We just killed His Son. That's incrimination. We're guilty. His blood is on us. And you can never praise God until you realize that He had to die and it was because of your sin. Until you realize that Jesus died where you should have died. Until you realize that Jesus faced the wrath of God that you should have faced. And until you realize that Jesus Christ took your punishment, you're never going to praise Him. You're never going to praise Him until you see that Jesus Christ is dead and it's because of you. Jesus Christ died and it's your fault. Have you withheld praise from Jesus? Have you procrastinated? Have you put it off? Have you said, I would about shout, but... I would about clap my hands. I would about rejoice. I would about stand up. I would about go to the altar. Or I would about... But something stopped us. Something stopped you. It's procrastinated praise. What stands in the way? I mean, this Roman centurion didn't have a third of what you have. He didn't know an ounce of what you know. All he knew was that Jesus was God and that God died for him. That's all he knew. That was enough for him to praise over. Here we are with the entire Bible. Here we are knowing that Christ resurrected. In a few weeks, we're going to celebrate uh, the resurrection on Easter Sunday. And we're going to celebrate that. And you've known that your whole life. Here, here we are with, with all these doctrines in our Bibles. Yet so quiet. So quiet. Just like the sunrise in the morning. It's just a sunrise. It happens every day. What's the big deal? It's just, it's just Jesus. What's the big deal? Been hearing him all my life. Been hearing about it since I was a little kid. How many of you went to Sunday school as a child? Raise your hand. You went to Sunday school as a child. And some Sunday school teacher, some lady or some man gave you a crayon and a picture and said, that's Jesus Christ. That's him. You remember that. You, maybe, you, maybe you painted a picture of a cross or maybe you cut one out of, out of a piece of paper and made it for your mother or for your dad. And you came out and said, look what we made in Sunday school. You've been hearing about Jesus so long, it's just like the sunrise. It's just Jesus. Happens every morning. Happens every day. No, used to get excited. Well, what if you woke up and the sun didn't get up that day? And the earth froze? Oh, you'd be upset. Oh, it'd be bad. What if you woke up one day and Jesus was gone? You wouldn't be froze. You wouldn't be froze, I'll tell you that. See, our hearts harden to the proportion of privilege we enjoy. The South is spoiled rotten with the gospel. The South is spoiled rotten with the gospel. You'd have, to, you'd have to drive a long way to find someone who's never heard of Jesus. You'd also have to drive a long way to find someone who's going to willingly and 100% just worship Jesus as he should be. He's not a big deal to us anymore. And church, by and large, procrastinates praise. Procrastinated. Something's stopping us. What's stopping you? Listen, don't put off for heaven what should be done today. Because look, when you get to heaven, you're going to praise Him. 
When you see the Son of God on His throne, you are going to come undone. I mean, undone. But why wait? Why wait? You don't have to wait to get to heaven to worship and praise Him. You don't have to about shout. You can. Don't procrastinate. Let's stand on our feet. Procrastinated praise. Every head bowed, every eye closed. The altar's open this morning. Jesus is the truth, the way that leads you into rest. Believe in him without delay, and you are fully blessed. Thank you for being in church today. I appreciate you being faithful, and I appreciate you being here. Listen, uh, just a few weeks away is Easter. Easter 2018 is fast upon us. And, uh, and so we're going to do something a little bit different this year. The ushers are going to come by. Uh, guys, y'all come on. And everyone's going to get one card. Easter is coming on us. And what we're going to do this year, I want everyone to get one card, one card per person. I want you to take this card home, and I want you to give that to one person. I want you to give it to one person this week and invite them to come to our Easter services. How many of you know when Easter is? Raise your hand. It's the first Sunday in April, first Sunday in April. And, uh, and so I want you to give that to one person this week. I want you to pray about it. In just a moment, Brother William's going to come, and he's going to pray. Uh, and when, when the church prays, I want you to pray that God would tell you who to give that card to. 
I'm not joking. I'm not trying to be weird or spooky, but I want you to pray and say, God, put someone on my mind, someone on my heart. Give me a name of someone to take and give this card to, to invite them to come to our Easter services, all right? I want you to pray about that. Brother Weaver's going to come. He's going to give you one closing announcement about tonight and then lead you in prayer, but I want you to take that thing serious, and, uh, and I want you to pray and ask God who to, who to give that card to.